Ask the Dean episode 106. 106. That's as old as you, isn't it, Dr. Wright? <laughs> <laughs> just kidding <laughs> hello hello wow. everyone um wow. we are the mapped team and our very special guest savannah perry from the pa platform we are so excited to have you here uh savannah perry you are a dermatology pa yes and one of the cool things about being a PA that I talk to students all the time about is they're like, well, we can we can change specialties if we want. Ha have you ever thought about it? Ooh, the only time I thought about it was when actually my husband was applying for residency mm. because everywhere he interviewed, I would look to see what jobs were available and we ended up not moving. But if we had moved it was nice to know if I couldn't find a derm job, there were lots of other options. But I've always said if I wasn't in derm, I would either be in something surgical, I love the OR, or endocrinology, which is very random, but I loved my endo rotation. Awesome, awesome. That's yeah. one of the the key things that, that uh, students always talk about. So I'm glad you you had that story to share because it is it's a thing. Like if if we need to move, we'll make it work, and I'll figure out what I can do. So yeah. that is awesome. So at the PA platform, for those who don't know who you are, um, podcasts, books, advising. You, you do it all. What what is what is uh, for someone who potentially may be interested in in going the PA route? Uh, what is the PA platform and why should they check it out? Yeah, it was my goal to just make it an all in one place for anyone interested in the PA profession. I think it's a great job, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a great job for everyone else. But it is a newer profession, so not as many people know about it. And for anyone interested in medicine. I think it's important to do your homework and really find what's going to be the best fit for you. So started as a blog and now we do have a ton of one-on-one -on -one services with mock interviews and essay review, but, you know, books to help with interviews and personal statements, lots of webinars and videos on YouTube, very much like yourself, um, podcast, trying to just get the word out and help people figure it out because it's very complicated and very confusing and I remember being there and feeling like I would never get in. And somehow I did. But now I just really like helping other people. In another life, I would be a college advisor. That was my backup plan if I didn't yeah. get into PA school. Yeah, that's awesome. And look at you now. You're, you're basically a college advisor, just right. not at a college. So, yeah, I made right. it up myself. Yes. Um, so, well, thank you for being here. And hopefully we get some great questions about the, the MDDO and PA route today. And we can have some great discussions. You and I had a great podcast a few years ago discussing kind of the differences between physician versus PA. So we can we can throw that up if we can find that. Dr. Scott Wright, not 106. Um, <laughs> how are you doing today? Former uh, Director of Admissions at UT Southwestern, retired executive director at TMDSAS. Freshly back from a vacation, so you look uh, young and spry and ready to go. Aren't you, How are you? sweet? Yeah, I'm doing well. I, I'm young and spry and ready to go. <laughs> that is awesome. And last <laughs> but not least, Verinia Granum. <sighs> How are you? Oh, Former uh, assistant dean of pre-health and STEM advising at Hofstra University. Um, hanging out, having fun, uh, helping yeah. students. That's our, yeah, yeah. That's our life. Doing, doing great. Yeah, this is this is the best life. This Working best. with college college students, non traditional students, uh, making making it happen for people. Yeah, awesome. Well, let's yeah. let's get to it. Uh, Rachel Grubbs is with us, but she is in the background today, helping uh, bring your questions up. The co-founder of Mapped. So, thank you, Rachel, for being the glue that keeps us together. <laughs> Jacob asks, I start med school in a month. Do you have any tips for exploring and deciding on specialties during med school? Savannah, I'm going to throw this to you because PA students have to do the same thing of like, okay, like I, I go to this professional school now. What do I want to do for the rest of my life? And again, we talked a little bit about it already that the PA world is a little different because 
there is no, at least not yet, uh, kind of big picture formal residencies that you go to and kind of keeps you boxed into one specialty. What is your recommendation for students as they go through this process to figure out what they may want to do specialty wise? Yeah, you know, I was somebody who was kind of interested in everything and I had done a good bit of shadowing in Durham before PA school. So I know I kind of had an interest in that, but I think going in with an open mind and not letting anyone else's experiences taint your experience. Yeah. Because I remember going into rotations, you know, we'd hear from the class above us, this rotation's awful, you're going to hate it. And then I got there and I loved it. Yeah. I, I It was great. And so I think you have to make those decisions for yourself and just be open. Talk to everyone you know, ask them questions, and you may be surprised to when I mentioned I had an interest in endocrinology, I hated endocrinology. It was my least favorite class in PA school. Absolutely hated it. So I was terrified of it for boards. And that's why I did a rotation mm. because I was like, this is my least favorite. I need to learn more about it. I put myself through a month of torture so I'll get better at it. And then it turns out that I really enjoyed it. And just having that hands on experience made it click so much more. And I thought the same thing with my husband he went from wanting to do surgery to ophthalmology to urology, and now he's a hospitalist. And you kind of also start to think about what you want your life to look like and what you want to do every day and have to put all of that together. So talking to others who have walked that path before you will be really helpful. Awesome. Yeah. And it's the same advice for, for medical school is, is keep an open mind even for students who go into medical school knowing knowing what they want to do, 75% of those students change their mind is the, the last data I've seen from the AAMC. Mm -hmm. So keeping an open mind and just, uh, again, as you said, ignore what other people say. And one of the biggest things and why I started uh, kind of a, an announcement here, why I started specialty stories was because that the far majority of medical education and exposure to specialties happens in urban academic medical centers. But the far majority of medicine that is practiced happens out in the community. And so what you see potentially kind of jade your opinion on going into a specialty that you thought you were going to love, but you're not seeing the full picture of what could be your life and your specialty. Um, and and the, the little mini announcement here is uh, specialty stories is going to take a an indefinite hiatus for right now as we focus on other projects and, and other things going on at Mapped and MedEd Media. So today's episode that goes out is uh, the last one for now. 229 episodes. We're going to take a little pause. Wow. So I think it's time. I think that covered plenty of specialties. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I think so too. Um, I, I know there were still some that are out there that we want to we want to get to, but that's the goal. All right. Kaylee asks, I'm trying to decide between PA school and medical school. I wanted to know what are the differences? Also, how does the work-life ratio differ between PA and doctor? So Savannah, another one I'll punt to you since uh, you're married to a doctor uh, and you are a PA. What, what does that work-life balance look oh, like? Man. Oh, this is a soapbox for me because I feel like that phrase gets thrown around and I just think it's a personal choice. I think whether you're a PA or a physician, you decide what that looks like for you. And I think as a PA, you do, you know, if you go straight in, typically finish school sooner. Uh, residency can take up a lot of those kind of youthful years of your life where you're super busy, but you're also busy during PA school and then figuring it out afterwards. So that's just something you decide. For me personally, I work part-time now, which is great. At my old practice, I worked more than any of the doctors. Now I work less than everyone else. And my husband, you know, he thought about doing an ICU fellowship, but that is where he made his decision to pursue a better work-life balance. So he works seven on, seven off. He rarely picks up extra shifts because he wants to be home and be able to spend time with us. So I think, you know, don't let that be the driving factor in making your decision between PA 
an MD or DO. I think if you spend time shadowing and and figuring out what you want your job to look like, because they're they're different, they're different jobs, even though some of the responsibilities overlap, that's where your decision really needs to come from. Yeah. Do you agree? That's, that's awesome. I, I do. I think um, it's a it's a big part. I think um, one of the cool things about being a physician is that you and, and a PA is, is that once you are done with school, you can craft the career that you want. Mm -hmm. If if you want to be an orthopedic surgeon and you're like, well, the orthopods that I saw are like they're working six days a week. And, and you look at the average work hours, it's like 60 something hours on average that they work. Well, that's what they're doing. But you can be an orthopod who works three days a week if you want. Mm -hmm. Obviously, your income is going to be less and you just have to adjust your life based on that. But you can do what you want. And I think a lot of students don't think about that. It's it's all or none. And mm -hmm. and they, they don't think about that that in between ground that they can find. So that's that's one of the best things I, I love. I talk about intentionality is we need to be intentional of the life that you want to have. And that includes the work life balance. Mm -hmm. So Definitely. yeah. Savannah, hey, you're asking questions? So the, they spelled it wrong. Uh, is it a red flag to only have clinical experience shadowing and volunteering during summer and winter breaks? During the semesters, I was focused on good grades, leadership, and being a chemistry TA. Dr. Wright, the uh, kind of uh, myelinated skipping from the, the, what are they called? The nodes of Ranvier? Is that what they're called? Um uh, that happens with myelinated nerves when you're skipping around uh, with activities only doing during the summer. Is that a potential red flag to schools saying, hey, you, you can't handle you can't handle the truth? <laughs> well, I, I would not say I, I don't think I would characterize it as a red flag necessarily. I think it could be something that might come up in a conversation, for example, in an interview or something like that where a, uh, a, a faculty member might want to explore, you know, why you've done things the way that you've done them. And is it, uh, you know, and try to try to tease out maybe, is this something that we should be concerned about? Um, I don't think it's optimal to do it the way that Savannah, you're, you're, you're saying that you've done it in terms of only during the summer or winter breaks. But uh, I don't think it's necessarily a, a, a red flag or anything. I, I just think it could lead to some, some further conversations and stuff. Now, having said that, it depends on what those summers and winter breaks look like, uh, what you did, uh, how, much you're, how much you did during the summer and winter breaks, and what kind of reflections you have on those uh, activities and, and being able to really talk about um, your, the, how, how meaningful they were for you. Uh, is it possible? Is it, is it uh, uh, possible to do it that way and be successful in this process? Absolutely it is. Um, but uh, I think that uh, it, it is something that uh, I think a variety of students may want to, to think about in terms of their planning out their, their, uh, their pre-med years. Awesome. Diva, I have to take two gap years since I'm expecting and do soon. Congrats. Uh, how can I explain that on my application? Varinia. So typically uh, when, when someone is a new parent, they're busy and not worried about clinical experience, shadowing, all this other stuff. So there may be a gap in their experiences. Yeah. Where on an application does this go? Like, do, do you put it other as a category and go, I'm, I'm a parent, leave me alone? <laughs> uh, it doesn't. It doesn't go on the application. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's life, right? You, um, you might mention it like during an interview. You might mention it uh, if you can maybe somehow weave it into your personal statement, if it's important to kind of bring that up and, and it shaped your story into, into this, into why you want to pursue medicine in some way. Um, but it's, it's not something that, um, there's no category for it, right? There's no yeah. way to, there's no category to, to explain that. So you just do the best you can. Um, yes, yeah. you're busy. 
you're busy. You're gonna be busy. It's yeah. okay. <laughs> Virtual opportunities yeah. now yeah. while while the kid is uh, sleeping because that's what they do <laughs> as they're newborns. They yeah. sleep a lot, uh, so potentially some virtual opportunities, virtual mm-hmm. shadowing to yeah. stay in touch there. Savannah, any any thoughts on what a, a a new mom may be able to do to to keep updated on all of their activities? Yeah, I think the virtual is a good idea with virtual shadowing. Uh, I've seen people doing virtual volunteering in in the prepa space as well and i think thinking about the other things so since you don't have time right now to maybe go and volunteer and do things maybe start thinking about your personal statement or your experience descriptions work on stuff that you can do right now to make the application process easier when you may have time later on to go volunteer and shadow and get clinical experience so then you're not as worried about that type of stuff so when you're sitting and you have your little baby on you you can be typing out some ideas for your application later on yeah good idea stay productive in some way and uh as always i i love talking about like give yourself some grace grace too um especially if this is your first child you haven't been through this process um you you may feel like you don't want to do anything and that's okay too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right Sleep when the baby sleeps. <laughs> yes, that's sleep when the baby sleeps. There you go. Rachel's that's, nice that. <laughs> that's good. Jennifer asks, does having an uh, an honorable discharge from having a stress fracture on my hip will will that be a red flag? Uh no. Not at all. No. Dishonorable. Yeah. Gonna be yeah. gonna be an issue, but yeah, if it's honorable, mm. if you are med boarded, um, then you're you're good. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Emma, I just took my MCAT retake, and I feel like I did really bad. I submitted to one school for MCAS and a Comus. I have no motivation for writing oh. secondaries. Oh. Any advice? Score comes back, uh, G- uh, July twenty sixth. Oh. Dr. Wright, uh, we as humans are pretty bad uh, at at judging our performance, yes. whether it's in an interview, a test. Uh, I, I don't know, Savannah, going through PA school, if you had classmates like this, but I know I, I did. The, the students that come out of a test, they're like, I bombed that test. That's terrible. And then they're like, oh, look, I got a 95. And I just want to punch them in the face every time. I refrain because I don't want a felony on my uh, record. But, uh, Dr. Wright, what, what kind of words of wisdom do you have here? Well, I, the, the first thing I would say is <clears throat> exactly what you just said, Emma. You can't, you can't tell how things, how things go uh, and, and what that MCAT score is going to look like. Uh, I think it's good that you submitted uh, AMCAS and ACOMAS already. Um, I would encourage you to, you know, have a, have a f- couple of days of, of getting your head together and, and really, you know, kind of, kind of de- debriefing yourself and, and psyching yourself back up and everything. And maybe just start in terms of the motivation for writing a secondary, maybe just start with writing one, do, doing mm-hmm. pre writing on one of them and, uh, and, and kind of get, get that one settled and everything. And, and then maybe that will provide you some motivation and, and kind of, kind of spur some more excitement for you and in, in, in the, in the future. But, uh, but, you know, I, I, I think I, I've seen it so often where students, just as you said, Ryan, how, how they, um, you know, they thought they did bad or they thought the interview went poorly or whatever. And, and it was just not the case at all. So I would say, you know, maybe do one secondary and, and get yourself remotivated, but uh, you know, uh, don't don't uh, don't belabor and you know and my experience is you you students y'all are you guys are hard on yourself I mean <laughs> you, I mean it is really you know I I, I I'm so um, I, I often really am concerned about some students who who just you know they just really beat themselves up over stuff and so don't yeah. do that you know just give yourself as we said a few minutes ago give yourself a little grace on this and and let yourself uh, kind of, uh, um, you know, but just, just p- push on and, and, uh, and, and then you'll see how things go when it comes back. It's funny because you, you wouldn't, you, you would support if a friend were going through this or a family member, you would support them. You would encourage them. You would motivate them, but we can't do that for ourselves sometimes. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. hang in there. Yeah. You can do this. Emma. Mm-hmm. 
you can do it. All right. Yes, you can. <laughs> Nathalie, uh, is it true that if you want to go to PA school, do you have to have two years of patient care? If someone has been out of school for a while, works on health care, uh, works on health care, but doesn't interact with patients. So one of the biggest differences, and I, I actually like how uh, I think most PA schools do this, is they are pretty straightforward. Like you, you we have required hours for what we want in terms of uh PCE, I think you guys call it, right? Patient care experiences. Um, Savannah, is it true? Two years of patient care. For most schools, there's not going to be a two-year requirement. So most schools do break it down by hours, and they'll say either we don't have a minimum or 100 hours, 500, 1,000, 2,000. 2,000 is about the highest actual requirement you'll see. Yeah. And just to kind of break it down – 2,000 hours is going to be around one year of working full-time. So if you work two years full-time, you're going to have 4,000 hours. You're going to be set. You're doing really well. The caveat to that is you also have to look at what the schools are actually accepting. And so when you see a school and you can look at their averages of the students who matriculated into the program, you may see there are certain schools, for example, MedEx, in um, up in Washington or Oregon, I get those confused somewhere away, far away from me. They mm-hmm. um, they typically want someone who has a ton of experience. So when you look at their averages, that hour is very high, even though their requirement is only two thousand hours. Mm-hmm. So you have to take that into account, but that's where this has to be personalized to you and what you're looking for in a program figuring out that list of where you want to apply and then figuring out what they want you to have so that you can figure out your timeline of how much experience you need to get. In general, having experience is never going to be a bad thing. I've never spoken to someone who took a gap year to get experience and regretted it. So if that's something that you think would be helpful, I would recommend it. The one thing you have to be cautious with is expiring prereqs because Some schools will also say that your prereqs can't be more than five years old. Mm -hmm. And then that can mess with your timeline a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's frustrating. Hayden asks, as deans of med schools, who is the person you are most appreciative of on your team? So... Interesting. So, so Dr. Wright, you're, you're the former director of admissions at a medical school. Um, maybe this is directed towards you. Uh, who are um, you? Oh, oh, maybe, maybe. So if you are, let's, let's, let's put it in context of if you're at the Dean of a medical school and, and you being a former director of admissions at a medical school, mm-hmm. who, who are you most appreciative of on your team at the med school? Gosh, this is a, a interesting question. I'm not really, <laughs> I'm struggling. I'm, I'm not really sure how to answer it. I, I think, you know, the first thing I want to do is differentiate between the dean of the medical school and the dean of admissions. Mm-hmm. These are two different pe- people. Yep. The dean of the medical school is the top, the top person. The, the, this is the person where, you know, it, it's at the pinnacle. Yep. Um, the, the dean of admissions or director of admissions is the person who directs the process for uh, selecting medical students. And so I think often for the dean, for the top dean, uh, you know, they depend on the admissions people to uh, admit uh, students that are going to be successful and are going to well represent the medical school and are going to be good at taking care of patients and, you know, all that kind of stuff. The other, the other, I think, sort of person that is, is a, is a key person uh, for many, many medical school deans is the student affairs dean uh, is the student affairs person that really uh, takes care of the students and, and makes sure that they're cared for appropriately, that they are encouraged, that they deal with uh, issues that come up, et cetera. So those are all also very important in the mind of a, of a uh, dean of a, of a medical school. Mm-hmm. And sometimes those two positions are combined, student affairs and admissions. It depends a little bit on the institution. Yeah. Cool. 
copper rex what is the best way to track your clinical and shadowing hours best well it's interesting you ask <laughs> <laughs> just happens to be last night i was bored and so i just created a website called mapped app uh, at mapped.com m-a-p-p-d.com where you can track all of your hours your um your grades you can track your mcat scores you can write reflections and and talk about everything you're doing um at mapped.com for uh rachel you want to throw up the 30 day um for a free 30 day trial of mapped app pro so mapped app is basically free uh mapped app pro allows you to chat with one of us uh one of our advisors not not savannah um <laughs> one, one of the mapped advisors uh if you have questions specific to the grades that you've entered the activities you've entered kind of your timeline anything like that you can uh, go go use that referral code 30 days free for uh, 30 days of mapped app pro mm -hmm. that was a great question it was wonderful <laughs> i i don't even think it was actually planted either <laughs> no. not that we would ever do anything like that we don't we don't <laughs> uh kaylee how was your experience looking for a job after graduating from pa school how's the job market for pas these day these days it was good when i graduated and i think it's still pretty good some of it depends on your state i'm in georgia which is very pa friendly mm -hmm. i since my husband was in med school started looking for jobs very early about eight months before i graduated some of my you know, classmates were taking great vacations and breaks after they graduated. And I was like, we need jobs. I need a job. We have those. <laughs> uh, so that was not what we got to do at the time. So I started looking and really being open to a lot of things. I interviewed in spine surgery and neurosurgery, almost accepted a neurosurgery job, kind of like verbally accepted. And then I ended up finding my derm position. Wow. I would say when you are considering where you're going to go to school, if you know you want to end up in a certain location and work there, it can be very helpful to at least be able to do your rotations there. The connections I made for jobs pretty much all came from my rotations. And so my derm job that I ended up with, my surgical preceptor knew the dermatologist. He had recommended her prior PA who was leaving called her, put in a good word, and I interviewed, and it was great. So I think networking plays a big role in finding jobs as a PA, and that's something you kind of have to put yourself out there, tell people what you want to do, but there are definitely plenty of jobs out there. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Matt Mack. I improved 11 points from my first MCAT. Is the, congrats, congrats. Is the poor performance. <laughs> they went from a 472 to a 483. <laughs> congrats, congrats. Um, <laughs> is the poor performance on my first one something I should discuss in secondaries or only if they ask in interviews? No, yeah. don't worry about it. Don't worry yeah. about it. No. They don't won't even ask. They won't even yeah. ask. Yeah. No. <laughs> I hope they won't ask. No, I don't think they will. <laughs> nope. Uh, McKenna, some schools have curriculum listed on their website. What should we be looking for in that curriculum? Good question. So I'll talk about this one a little bit because when I went to med school a few years ago, um, the uh, the understanding that I had was none. I didn't, I didn't really understand what was out there and what the different curriculum types were. And I hold steady um, the fact that I probably would have done a lot better in medical school if it was a systems-based curriculum. So my medical school was a very traditional. All of the classes were separate. You would go through anatomy, physiology, pathophysiology, pharmacology, all separate siloed um, subjects. And it was really hard for me to, to figure all that out. I very much uh, like to see big picture things. And so a systems-based curriculum is we're going to learn the cardiovascular system. 
right now. And during this time, we're going to learn the anatomy, the physiology, the pathophysiology, the pharmacology, the histology, all of the stuff for the cardiovascular system. So you can see how it all works together. Uh, and that I think would have worked very well for my brain. Um, some schools have different styles of teaching, whether it's problem-based learning or flipped classrooms. Mm -hmm. So those are things that you just need to uh, kind of, we were going back a, a while ago to the conversation of being intentional, just understanding what you think would work best for you, looking back on your uh, how you learned best during undergrad or post back if you're doing that or a master's program um, and, and just making some assumptions and a leap of faith at the end of the day of what's going to work best for you. Mm -hmm. And then going to school lists of like, where do you want to be and what schools are you interested in and, and the schools that potentially you want to be location wise may not have this, the curriculum that, that you want. And then you got to do some, some soul searching of what's, mm -hmm. what's more important for you. Mm -hmm. Savannah, do PA schools have uh, different curriculums like systems-based and traditional stuff? What, is, what does that look like there? Yeah, it varies. So there's systems-based, problem-based, like you mentioned. Uh, I was in a systems-based program. It was great. I really enjoyed that oh. approach. I think th the curriculums can get a little confusing when you look at them online. And this is something I've seen. I don't know if you guys have seen this. I've seen students focusing on kind of how it's listed a little bit more on the websites when I think you sometimes have to dive a little deeper, like go to an info session, talk to students, um, because at least for PA school education, what you learn is very standardized. Just because a curriculum doesn't list ophthalmology doesn't mean you aren't going to learn it. You will because it's required that you learn that. So as far as the subjects, that stuff is going to be pretty consistent across the board. It's how you're learning it that may vary a little bit or how it's organized, if that makes sense. Yeah. Anissa, hey, hello. Anissa. I've started getting secondaries. I know we should submit it early. What is the time frame for that? So uh, unless, typically, unless the school says uh, what their required deadline is for secondary, the general rule of thumb that we always talk about is two weeks. Now, that's not a hard and fast rule, but ideally two weeks. That if schools want to track how long it's taking you to return secondaries, they can track that and go, hey, it took you a month and a half to return the secondary. You're probably not super interested in us, and we're not going to waste our time with you. Yeah. Georgina, do you need research to get into a research-centered medical school? Dr. Wright, UT Southwestern's big research-heavy medical center. Um, when you were looking at uh, kind of your processes uh, at UT Southwestern, again, former director of admissions, how much did research in an application weigh into the fact that a student would be a good fit at the school? In terms of fit, uh, none. Uh, it was, uh, you know, part of the process of looking at a student. Wh what have they done? What do they know about what they've done? How have they reflected on it, et cetera? But uh, we, we would have often many medical, many applica applicants to medical school at Southwestern where they didn't have, they had maybe very little research or even uh, none. And that was not a, a big deal for us. Now, there are some medical schools out there that if, if you don't have research, they're not even going to look at you. But I think that that's not, not the rule of thought. That's not the rule. That's more a, a, an exception to the rule. And so I, I think if you are interested in research, do it, uh, see what it's like. But I don't, think it's, I don't think that you have to have research experience to get into uh, any medical school necessarily or maybe a, a, a couple, as I mentioned earlier, but, um, but uh, I, even at um, research intensive institutions, I don't think it's absolutely necessary that you do that. 
Yeah, there, there are other ways to show interest in research other than yeah. doing research. Obviously, MD, PhD, DO, PhD uh, yeah, exactly. programs, very yes. different, yes. Um, where you have research essays that you have to write about the research. <laughs> right, program. right. Um, I, I had a conversation once with an admissions <laughs> member of, um, it was UCSF, so huge, I think everyone huge, would agree, right. big research big institution. Research. Mm -hmm. and, and he was like, we, we look at people who don't have research. It's, it's a myth out there that we only accept people with tons of research. Our goal is to do research at our institution, not to only accept people who have done research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's right. <clears throat> Joe, does intensity or, quote, name brand of undergraduate school matter? For example, is a 2.7 GPA from a top 10 school or military academy weighted the same as a 2.7 GPA from a community college? Verinia, what do you think here? Yeah, I don't, it, I don't think it matters. It doesn't matter. Um, they're weighed the same. 2.7 is a 2.7. Um, Joe, so uh, it's not something that I would um, stress over. Uh, if you're thinking like if you're in a community college that it's going to be viewed somehow lower or different, it's not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Savannah, for PA schools, what is the, the general kind of sense of prestige of undergraduate institutions for PA schools? Also does not matter as long as you hit the minimums. That's what they care about. Yeah, do well. And again, that's a you say hit the minimums. A lot of PA schools have very published uh, public minimums in terms of science GPA, cumulative GPA. Um, so it's it's a very different kind of transparency, which I love in the process. Mm -hmm. And let me let me just add to that, Joe. That um, this is a, a, a topic very interesting to me and very uh, relevant to me as I did my dissertation on this very topic. And uh, what, what I found in, was that what I looked at was how did students perform actually in medical school based on where they came from, what, what college they came from, what type of school, was it big or small, or was it competitive or public or private or research oriented or not, et cetera. And in terms of medical school performance, uh, when we look at, uh, I was looking at USMLE scores as well as uh, GPA in medical school, there was no difference at all. And mm -hmm. so, uh, so this, is, this is a real key question and, and, and I think an important question, but I think that, uh, that uh, medical schools are not looking at, you know, just as you've heard, uh, this, this is not something that's going to affect them. Armin, do medical schools look at the major? So very similar question here. Uh, for mm -hmm. example, neuroscience GPA 3.3 versus art 3.9. Are those viewed the same? And, and probably same answer of, of undergrad prestige. Right. GPA is GPA. They don't have the time or bandwidth or fancy algorithms to look at all those differences. So mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the things that a lot of students will say is like, take the easiest major. And I'm like, I don't really like that advice. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, you want a good GPA, but you should also be doing something you're enjoying and not just to, to hack the system to get a good GPA. Right. And pro tip, if you are enjoying your classes, you will do better in them. And by default, yes. your GPA will be a lot higher. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Justin, any advice for financing applications, MCAT, MCAT prep classes, et cetera? Very difficult at Scribe wages. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes. Uh, yes, <laughs> it is. Um, we, we've had discussions of like, do we like uh, micro loans are very big and, and, um, uh, underdeveloped countries or, or developing countries. Um, I was like, Oh, it'd be cool to, to think about how do we, how do we do that in the, the pre-med space? So, um, yeah. Uh, save as much money as possible. A side hustle. If you can find some side hustles, if you uh, are really good at chemistry or organic chemistry, go tutor some students. Um, it's hard. And any, uh, hacks for saving money, on the application process, Savannah? I think planning ahead too. That's what I see with a lot of students in the pre-PA spaces. They 
don't, they kind of wait to the last minute and yeah. then have all of these expenses come up all at once. So if you can know what's coming, it helps you save and know what you need to save a little bit more, especially for things like interviews and mm -hmm. yeah. suits and things mm -hmm. that are going to come up for interviews. I've had, I've seen people turn down interviews because they can't afford to get to them. And it just kills mm -hmm. me because, you know, they work so hard to get there. So I think planning ahead, uh, birthday presents, Christmas presents. I never know what to say when people ask me. So, you know, ask them for that. I went to the library to get my GRE study books. They were free. I just rented them. You know, use the resources you have. Use each other. Use your pre-health, pre-PA, pre-med clubs um, when y'all can kind of help each other figure out resources to share and, and share what's worked or any, you know, coupons or uh, savings that you find, pass them along and others will do the same. Yeah. I think a lot of people, um, uh, aren't willing to sacrifice, um, lifestyle. Uh, and mm -hmm. it's not like the don't, don't go to Starbucks. Um, but where do you live? Like, are you living by yourself? Go get some roommates. That'll cut down on expenses. Go move in back with your parents if you can. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't talk about personal life a lot. We sold our house and, and we're renting a house right now because my wife wanted to open up her own private practice and we were two business owners and we, we need as much cash as possible to run businesses and, and make sure everything is, everyone's getting paid. And so we sacrifice or like home ownership is like the gold standard in this world. And we're like, we don't care about home ownership. We're going to rent for a while. And we, we love renting because when, when things break, it's not our problem anymore. Right, right. Um, <laughs> yeah. and, and so, again, just being intentional. Uh, I, I love a service called Digit. Uh, Digit.co, I believe, is, is the website where it basically lets you save for a rainy day fund or you can give it specific goals to say, hey, my, my application budget. And you, you tell it how much money you want to save and, and buy when and connect it to your bank account. And it uses whatever fancy kind of algorithms to go, hey, Justin has uh, $30 in his bank account. And I don't think any bills are coming uh, due soon based on recent transactions and everything else. We're going to we're going to steal a dollar fifty from his bank account today and then tomorrow it'll look again and so without needing you to do anything just setting that up you'll wake up one day and have a thousand dollars sitting over in this other account that you didn't have to think about so those are fun little hacks that i like to think about mm -hmm. and and keep in mind in terms of financing applications uh any kind of uh system like the double amc has the fap uh, things like that can yeah. can be be very helpful as well. Yep. Yeah. F FAP is. Uh, I think they give over twenty million dollars in FAP uh, funding every year. It's it's not capped like uh, unfortunately a Comus FAP is. Um, the the DO application has their own FAP, but the WMC doesn't cap it. So mm -hmm. if you qualify, go get it. Angelina, when med schools say recommended, does that mean <laughs> necessary to have a better chance? Dream Med School has a foreign language class recommendation. I'm fluent in another language. Is that good enough? Probably good enough. Yep. Unless it's a specific language. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I can't imagine that that would be the case. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so Scott, let's talk about this because this is part of the game, right? We were just talking with Savannah a minute ago of like they have minimums that are typically published for schools. They have minimum GPAs and minimum uh, patient care experience hours. Med schools are much more opaque in terms of what they want and what they expect. And then yes. they play these games of like highly recommend slash required or recommend. And it just drives students bonkers. Like, well, yeah. does that is this like a hidden curriculum here of like, that means I should probably do it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, 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 I agree with you that I think that it's a failure on the part of the medical schools to have, have something like that where it's not very clear what, what that means. Uh, but, and, and it's, it's like the uh, TMDSAS uh, mm -hmm. optional essay you know <laughs> yep. it's 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 yeah. listed as an optional essay but it's not it's really not, it's not really optional in terms mm -mm. of what i think what i think you should consider so i i think angelina that 
if you see recommended on a medical school application or recommended on a school's website, I think you need to interpret that as I need to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Savannah, would you agree similar for PA schools? Yeah. I always say, you know, recommended is technically required. So (laughs) yeah, yeah. technically not technically. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, do the required first, but then if you're like, I don't know what to do next recommended. Yep. Do that. Absolutely. (sighs) So frustrating. Uh, uh, Amideo, uh, Amidio. Uh, I'm a pharmacy student, P2. I've been doing rotations in clinical pharmacy, talking to patients about meds, uh, taking med lists, MTM. What's MTM, et cetera. Does that count as clinical experience for a medical school app? Yeah, sounds yeah. like it. Mm-hmm. I would what's, so. what's M- Savannah, do you know what MTM is? I don't. MTM. Yeah, yeah I don't know. Let us know. Immediately. Let us know. <laughs> Learn something new every day. And a good example to never use jargon in your applications yeah. because yeah. not everyone knows everything. Mm-hmm. Medical therapy management. Management. Oh. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Google. Yeah, uh, right. <laughs> Andrew asks, during the application process, does it make sense to reach out to ADCOM's deans, research professors, or other staff to either learn about the school or express interest before getting an interview? <laughs> no. Oh, Stay away from no, them. No, no, Leave them alone. Yes. yes. You yes. can go on their websites, of course, and their social media. Right. Yeah. Right. YouTube, whatever. But yeah. If they have an info session, go to it. Yeah. Info yep. sessions are great. Absolutely. Too. Definitely. So typically what, what we often talk about is the rules of engagement. Uh, and I've had conversations with adcoms about this is pre-application, they potentially have more flexibility in talking to you. Post-application, they don't want to make it seem like they're giving you mm-hmm. preference or, or any sort of special treatment. And so there's different rules of engagement if you're a pre applicant versus in the application cycle Mm -hmm. and they're all busy so uh, i would generally leave them alone let them do their job agreed fun size 198 do you think interviews this year will be virtual or in person i really like the virtual aspects for cost yes virtual is is going to be i think the majority again uh, hopefully forever but we'll see Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think most med schools, mm-hmm. um, are going to be virtual. There are a handful that are in person that have been in person the last several years for some reason. Um, but that'll, it'll stay the same this year. Mm-hmm. for the most part. I had a, I had a student that I was talking to just today that at, that on a secondary application, the question was, do you have a preference virtual or in person interviewing? Mm-hmm. And, uh, my comment to this uh, student was, be honest. Don't in, don't overanalyze that question. Yep. Just answer the question to what you think would be best <laughs> for you. But if and- they don't overanalyze, then they can't be an official member of the OPC, <laughs> Scott, the Overthinking I, Pre-Med Club. I know. I know. I know. I get it. I get it. But, you know, don't just, an- you know, just answer it the way that you feel and, uh, let that stand on stand on its own you know you can't yeah. you can't do that but that's good that goes back to kind of the whole required recommended mm-hmm. thing of right right if you have a hybrid model for interviews and and schools are going to be doing this where some interviews are in person and some are virtual every student is going to assume well in person students are going to get weighted mm-hmm. higher right well, so and sure. and that is, and and I think that it's it's really important on the case of the medical school to say, yeah, it does not matter if you interview on campus or if you interview virtually. We are not going to differentiate between those, or you know, whatever. Yeah, I think that's really, I, I think that's really important. Now, whether or not the med schools will do that, I, you know, who knows? Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I think that's. You know that would be important uh, for for the student to know. Otherwise, they are going to obsess over that very issue. And you know, I'm reminded one year when I was at Southwestern, we we had a pretty laid back interview day, uh, and we toyed with the idea 
of encouraging students not to dress up in suits and all that stuff, but to wear business casual, mm -hmm. you know, and to, uh, to be more comfortable and wear comfortable walking shoes and to, you know, just have a more enjoyable day. And we got talked out of that because it, the recognition was that would freak students out because <laughs> then they would be obsessing about well what shirt do i wear well what i don't know what to do i i have yeah. my suit picked out and now they're throwing this kink into it and you know mm -hmm. whatever so we didn't know yeah okay. the opc yeah that's that's <laughs> and, it's a new and, club i'm founding and just and just by the way you do not have to look like you're going to a funeral to get no, to you no. <laughs> yes, yes. Don't don't wear a fuzzy red leisure suit, but uh, it doesn't don't have, have to wear to, yeah. all black. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, someone, sorry, someone recently posted. I think it was on Reddit. They they were asking something, and and somebody was like, "I heard that a student dressed as a furry for their interview and got in." And I'm like, "God, the people, <laughs> the things people believe on the internet." Oh, it's unbelievable. <laughs> yes, I guarantee. And Don't I would love started. to be proven wrong. I would guarantee nobody dressed as a furry and got into med school. Right. right. As a furry? As a furry, yes. They dress up like a furry animal. Is, go Google it. Okay. I don't know what a furry is. It's, it's a whole culture. Uh, yes, of, yes. It is. Go, go check it out. Yes. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> moving on. This is a PT show. <laughs> Jennifer asks, uh, will it look bad on a med school application to retake a class I got a C in? Two, do they look at just the science GPA or the cumulative? Mm -hmm. Verinia. Mm. They look at both. They do look at both. They look at, they look at your science and your cumulative. Will it look bad if you retake a, a class that you got a C in? No, unless you do worse. <laughs> um, <laughs> or the same. <laughs> or the same. Yeah. Uh, it won't look bad, uh, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, you know, a passing, you should retake anything in which you got a C minus or less. A C is a passing grade. So yeah. I wouldn't stress it. Yeah. Generally, what we talk about, we get this question a lot, especially mm -hmm. for like core foundational classes like Gen Chem 1 or Bio 1 is is retake it if you think you need that foundation. Um, if, if you got a C because you you bombed the final because mom was sick and you didn't sleep all night, but you're like, well, I, I, I was doing great before then. So I, I have the foundational knowledge to move forward in my advanced biochemistry, whatever classes. Um, but if you don't think you have a good solid foundation to, to take those other classes, then, then retaking it may be helpful. Mm -hmm. Savannah, does uh, do PA schools have a similar kind of cutoff for for most med schools? A C minus is is not considered passing. Are, are PA schools similar? Yes. So for prereqs for PA school, you're usually going to see a requirement of a C plus or B minus or higher. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So even even higher. Yes, and we have a very this is, may have changed in the past 10 years, but when I was going through it with my husband and we were both applying to schools, I remember our we have a very specific list of prereqs mm -hmm. that is fairly long and involved and varies between schools, mm -hmm. which complicates the process. And they all decide what they want that grade to be. So, uh, yeah, it can become very complicated when you're looking at a C, typically a C for a prereq class, you are going to need to retake most likely, mm -hmm. depending on the rest of your application. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Good difference there. Um, time for one more, I think. Yeah. Um, Hamad, how do you, how do you say that? Let me know. Uh, how is a post back GPA looked at schools? Just going back to school to take upper level science courses to increase a science GPA of three point six nine. Three point six nine is pretty good yeah. science yeah. GPA. Yeah, I'm not sure, sure why. Uh, how does this impact getting into a top school, considering only GPA? Well, top schools don't only consider GPA. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, mm -hmm. more grades at a four point is is never a bad thing. Mm -hmm. So, but three six nine is a pretty decent science GPA. So, mm -hmm. yeah, good job. Yeah, yeah. Well, Ask the Dean, episode 106, coming to a close with our very special guest, Savannah Perry. 
uh, let everyone who's hanging out here with us know where to, where to find you on the interwebs. If you look up the PA platform, you'll find me everywhere. So everywhere. for TikTok, I'm just at physician assistant, but you'll still find me there if you look up the PA platform. So yeah, any PA questions, if you didn't get your question answered, send it to me on Instagram or email, wherever. Happy to answer. Go, go find her. Thank you for joining us and Thanks hanging out and, and answering some great questions about the PA world. Dr. Scott Wright, Verenia Granum, thank you. As always, if you all are interested in working with one of our advisors, go to mapped.com. And don't forget to check out our free Mapped app platform as well. We'll see you next week. Bye, everybody. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.